I'm going to ask you to write some things on there. But if you need more, you can go back and get some more off the back table. If you didn't get a card and a pin, please grab one. Um, and, hope, and check and make sure the pin works because some of those pins are a little questionable. Um, and as we're going through, if you have questions, feel free to stop me, but also feel free to write your questions down on the card. Right? And if it's easier for you to hand the card to me or hand the card to somebody else to hand to me, it's fine to do that as well. Okay? So um, the title of this talk is Intentional Parenting. And so what I mean by that is being proactive or planning in advance for parenting. And I find that most of us, I know myself as a parent, um, I was more reactive than I was proactive. Um, and so as I work through my career as a principal, um, I find again and again the importance of being prepared. And the analogy I like to use is driving. So when we're driving, especially around here, uh, it can be a stressful event. So I find that if I prepare myself in advance for the likelihood of something happening that might upset me, I'll respond better when it does happen. But I need some kind of tangible reminder. And everybody's different, right? So I wear a paper clip uh, somewhere, and it helps me with a number of things. But every time I get in my car, I try to think of that paper clip, and it reminds me so to be calm and prepare myself by doing things like breathing um, and doing some deep breathing so that if something does happen while I'm driving, uh, I'll hopefully won't be too upset by that and respond again in a more positive way. Parenting, I think, is the same kind of thing, that we need to give ourselves reminders, especially when we're about to see our kids again, if your kids are in school, in order to more su successfully respond when things happen. Does that make sense? Okay, so first of all, a little bit about me. Um, I've been a principal for 22 years. I was a teacher for 11 years before that. I raised two daughters. Um, my wife is a special education teacher in the Campbell School District. Uh, our daughters now are grown and have moved out. Um, my oldest daughter, who's actually the one on the end, uh, just turned 28. She's a fourth grade teacher in the East Bay. And my younger daughter is 25 and she's a social worker down in Southern California. So um, I can tell stories about parenting them, but I won't bore you with those. I will tell you that they were students at the school where I was the principal. And that created some very interesting dynamics um, and, and also a lot of fun. Um, but um, uh, my wife and I, uh, both being educators, uh, thought we were pretty good at parenting, but we ended up taking a step, systematic training and effective parenting. Anybody familiar with that? Uh, it was a helpful course. That was the first parenting course we took. I took Love and Logic. Anybody heard of that one? So that's another one that's been uh, pretty well known. Um, and then I took Positive Discipline, and I kept taking Positive Discipline, the program by Jane Nelson. Um, and I probably took positive discipline trained about 10 times. And then I decided, I knew it so well that I would become a trainer of positive discipline. So I took the training course uh, in that so that I could train others. And some of what you're gonna get today is positive discipline. Some is from STEP. Um, and some is just my personal experience and things that I pulled together. So I'm not necessarily pushing any particular parenting program, but I am encouraging you to take a parenting class. What we're gonna do today is a snapshot. I'm gonna throw a bunch of stuff at you, give you a chance to interact with it a little bit, but there's nothing that substitutes a full parenting class. I'm biased towards positive discipline. There are trainers in this area, and it's a course that will take you several weeks, um, but it's really valuable to really get entrenched in positive discipline. So if you get um, intrigued or interested in some of those things, I encourage you to pursue that. Okay. So this cartoon sums up almost everything I'm gonna to say today. Um, and I always show this when I talk to parents um, because to me it just speaks to uh, the idea that some of the things in our children that we may find challenging or even abrasive may be the very things that in adulthood 
allow them to be really successful people. And so as parents, we have to be really careful that we don't try to shape certain behaviors or decrease or minimize certain behaviors that in the long run could be super valuable for your kids. So to give you kind of an extreme example, um, in England right now and other parts of Europe, there's a big movement to implement risky play. So I mean, some of you may have seen these things. Um, there's been videos on the news, other places. Uh, they have developed parks that look like junkyards. They don't look like parks. And they encourage the kids to go in there and create things and make things. And one of the things the kids can do is start fires. So when people hear that, they're kind of like, really? Um, they're encouraging risky play. Now, why would they be doing that? Any ideas? Why would we want to encourage kids to go and play? And if I showed you a picture, you'd, you'd think this kid wandered and got lost and ended up in a junkyard, but they're actually designed parks. Any idea why would we want to encourage kids to play in a risky way? So that they learn. Okay. So what are they learning when they're playing that one? Well, safety. Okay. So they're learning safety. Yeah. To get a risk in the future, I will get a lot. Because if we don't teach them to get risky, for example, I'm uh, playing uh, with my children. Yeah. Uh, I always you know, say, don't touch, don't do this, don't. Yeah. But uh, in the future, maybe yeah. we are not you know, doing. <laughs> yeah. They think that, OK, it's not safety. I'm not able to get, I'm not get uh, risk. OK. They're, they're naturally exploring their limits, right? So that's one of the benefits. Another benefit of risky play is that learning to be a risk taker can be a really valuable asset in their careers. So if you look at people who have made profound differences, have been super successful, especially here in Silicon Valley, a lot of these folks are risk takers. So I happened to be a high school buddy and a basketball teammate uh, with a person who went on and became the CEO of Intel. Um, so obviously super successful. He was probably one of the riskiest people that I ever had as a friend. So as far as the kinds of things that he did when we were young and in high school. Uh, he was also, by the way, not a very good student. So uh, we didn't realize, we being my friends, my circle of friends, how smart he was until he graduated from college and started getting patents for chemical processes for making microchips. And then we were like, oh, I guess Brian's a little smarter than we thought he was. So we had this perception of him that was very different than who he ultimately became um, and what he grew into. But part of that was being somebody who was willing to push the limits and take that risk. So I'm trying to change your perspective about certain behaviors. Right, to look at them perhaps in a broader way and see that some of the behaviors that you may find challenging may actually be beneficial behaviors in the long run. In the short run, they're gonna be really challenging for you. <laughs> right? Doesn't make it easier as a parent, but hopefully it changes your response to some of those behaviors. Okay, so before we jump into some stuff, a few agreements, um, and I'm just gonna really quickly go over these. You know the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What's shared in here, I hope will stay in here. Okay? Some of you may feel comfortable enough to share some of the things that you're experiencing with children. Um, it's important that you have a confidential space to do that, especially if you're at the same school as somebody who would want things going back. Um, so no judgments. We're all learners, including me, of course, and we're all teachers. We can learn from each other, and we will end on time. Okay? So our end time is 10.30. We will finish at 10.30. I have never finished this presentation. I've probably given it 30 times, so I don't expect to finish today. But I will tweak it a little bit depending on what you all need. Um, so I may go over some slides very quickly or just completely skip them. And I'm doing that because in my head I'm kind of keeping track of where we need to go. Okay, so you have a card and hopefully a pen or pencil that works. On that card, I want you to answer this question. So you can just do bullet points or list things very quickly. What do you most want for your child? Now, if you have more than one child, uh, you can list for your children, but it might be more helpful for you to think about one child while doing this and perhaps pick the child that you may be having 
the biggest challenges left. Okay? And list all the things that you most want. So maybe the top three, four, uh, five things that you want for your child. So go ahead and take a minute to do that. It's more the latter. So like, yeah. how do you want their life to be? What do you want for them oh. as they become okay. adolescents? I assume most of your kids are elementary age. As they become teenagers, as they become young adults, what do you want for them? Oh, okay. Thanks. It's fine. Mm -hmm. it's easy. But he will say. <laughs> he, he cried. It's not going to bother me. <laughs> so if it doesn't bother you, please stay. <laughs> it's fine. Not a problem. I'm used to presenting with like kids running around or something, so Working on that, but while you're finishing up, anybody want to share one or two things from your list? Uh -huh. um, I want my kids to be bold enough to try new things okay. throughout their lives. Okay, great. Anybody else? I want him to be uh, focused on what the thing he was doing, uh, don't like uh, work on one thing, and then for one minute and then do another thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And kind of caring, helpful, happy, and strong, and dependent. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. I want them to be happy what they are doing. Okay. And also uh, when they, I mean, when they give up, when they encounter a problem, they can manage it, like without getting stressful. They can manage, okay, I encountered this, 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 but uh, they can uh, see that I get calm and quiet and think about, okay, this is a mistake I did, but I can have some re resiliency yeah. here. Okay, very good. Anybody else want to share? Okay, so right next to that list, I want you to create another list. What does your child most want for themselves? Yeah. Write them down. Yeah. Yeah. You can use the same side or the other side. The question? What was the question? What does your child most oh. want for themselves?
is a little bit of a unfair question, isn't it? Okay. It's an unfair question because children, especially if you have young children, very much live in the moment, right? So your children probably aren't going to share with you what they want in the future because they don't think about the future, right? They're living very much in the moment. So there's a couple reasons why I did this. One is because I think we need to learn from our children to live more in the moment. The other thing is I want you to look at your list and see if there's anything that stands out as, to you as to where there's alignment and where there might be misalignment between what you want and what you think your child wants. I know you have to, again, you're, you're, you're kind of assuming for your child's sake what they want based on what you see happening in the moment, but it's important that what you want for your child and what your child wants for themselves are aligned. And often what a parent wants and what a child wants can be quite different. And I'm going to tell you, you don't have to agree with me, that you need to let go of what you want for your child. And this is very difficult for children to do. So Freud said that the unlived life of the parent is the greatest impediment to a child's well-being, right? And we see that in our culture, especially, I think, all the time. There's so much pressure put on kids, and kids will tell us, they tell us, educators, that that pressure is not coming from their teacher. It's not coming from their principal. It's coming from mom and dad. So, and not only is it causing the kids stress, we have the highest levels of anxiety that we've ever seen in children. It is now the number one mental malady that children face that has surpassed depression. We see a dramatic increase in not only the number of kids who have been diagnosed with anxiety, but also the severity of that anxiety and what it's doing to those kids. I'm not blaming parents solely for this issue, but it's definitely a factor, and it's the one thing that you can control, right? You can't control the pressure that kids feel from school. You can help with that, but you can't really control it, but you can control the pressure that kids feel from you, okay? Questions or comments before I move on? Okay, so I'm gonna just preach at you a little bit, and so I'm not gonna belabor this. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, um, I think it's a vocational hazard, but I'm sure it happens to all of you too. Almost every time I go out to dinner, I see a family that looks like this sitting around the table, and it drives me crazy, right? So I, if I give parents one piece of advice, if I could only give you one piece of advice, it would be to put your phone away, actually put it away, physically remove it from your body, and spend five minutes with your child. Five minutes. That's all. And I think you would see a dramatic change in your relationship with your child. Children tell us that their parents are distracted by their phones. Okay, there's been lots of research about this now. I highly recommend this uh, this organization. Wait until eight. How many of you have kids that are in middle school now? Okay, you've got a couple. So everybody else, their kids will get there, of course. So this organization, you can tell by the name, is advocating that you wait until they are in eighth grade before you give them a phone. One of the things that you'll see if you go on their website is that they reference CEOs of high-tech companies here in Silicon Valley and, and talk about how many of them have withheld phones from their children waiting until eighth grade and won't give their kids a data plan on their phone until they're 16 years old. These are people, of course, who have immersed their lives in technology but have been very cautious about giving that same technology to their children. So you can read all of the things that the use of a uh, cell phone has been linked to up here. So if you go on the website, you'll see some of the research. I'll share a little bit more with you. Um, so one study uh, done by Larry Rosen um, found that um, when students were given a choice, they were given the choice. They could study anything they wanted to. And these were older students, high school and college age. They could not sustain their focus. Right. We're seeing now in lower ages that kids are having a 
difficult time, much more difficult than they did before, learning to comprehend when they're reading. So teaching reading has changed as a result of technology in our culture and the fact that younger and younger children are exposed to technology. So if you ever watch a child watching a video, right, just count in your head how many seconds elapse before a scene change, especially if it's a video for a young child. It's like two seconds, right? Constant scene change. You don't even have to listen to the, to, to the volume to realize that they're getting, their brains are being trained, right, to respond very quickly, but there's very little opportunity to sustain their attention, and that affects their ability to comprehend what they read. So we're seeing all these kids in school now who can decode, I don't call it reading. They can read or decode anything, but ask them questions, especially questions that require some deeper thought about what they're reading, and they really, really struggle. So we're definitely seeing this in school, and it's borne out in study after study like this, that we're actually physiologically changing the brains of our children through their constant exposure to technology. And again, as a parent, it's something you can control, right? Your child, especially when they're a preteen or a teen, is gonna be very unhappy with you. You're gonna hear about how every other kid has an iPhone, and that's nice, and you're gonna have to acknowledge that, but you also need to set that boundary with your kids. And the earlier you start, the better. Start by not buying them a phone. If you've already bought them a phone, take the data plan away, okay? Because remember, I could go back a couple slides, all of the things that it exposes kids to. And as they get older, you're gonna find out what FOMO is if you don't already, okay? Does anybody know what that is? What's FOMO? Anybody wanna share? Fear of missing out. Huge thing for kids. And the sad thing is, you can watch a group of teens, go to either one of our middle schools, go to anywhere else where there's teens or preteens, and you'll see kids hanging out with each other and every one of them's on their phone. They are with a group of friends, but distracted from being with their friends and really enjoying their friends because they're worried they might be missing some, out on something with another group of friends or other friends somewhere else. It's constant, it's pervasive, and it really affects their relationships. So you can control that. Again, uh, the, the link between cell phones and anxiety, if you can read this chart, okay, basically these are the heavy daily users have this significant rate of anxiety compared to light phone users, okay? So control the time that your kids are in technology if you're not doing that already. Okay, you wanna, yeah. So I do have a middle schooler, this is not the middle school talk, I know. But, um, and she has a phone, not a smartphone, but just like one of those flip phones that's yeah. only text and yeah. all. Yeah. Um, but they are all given Chromebooks yes. in middle school. Yes. And so now I'm finding her constantly yeah. distracted on her Chromebook. Yeah. And it's like, well, we tried yes. to not give her data. Yeah. But and then the school gave it to her. And then the school gave it to her. Yeah. And somebody said the exact same thing when I did the middle school talk at Union Middle School a couple weeks ago. So definitely point taken and something that I'm going to share because I agree that that's a valid concern. And we're giving kids now laptops in fifth grade that they keep until eighth grade. And so there are definitely some great strengths or potentials for doing that. Again, there has to be parameters. I'm not saying don't buy your kid a phone. I'm saying don't give them a data plan with it. I agree. Right? So, uh, with technology, if, if it's used correctly, it can be an incredible tool for creativity, right? It can be an amazing tool for organization, especially for kids that have ADHD or struggle with organizational skills. It has, I could go on and on with all the potential things that it can do that can be a benefit to kids, but there's also that risk of exposure, and there has to be parameters and controls put on it in order for it to be successful. So our kids, especially young children, are not ready to be exposed to what's out there on the internet, right? There's too many things. And even with the controls that we have in school, I'll be honest with you, there are times when kids 
inadvertently most of the time stumble onto something that they shouldn't see. And sometimes that can be very upsetting for kids. So point well taken, and it's something that we need to continue to discuss, not only as a school district, but as a society, right? How much do we want to give kids these tools when the potential for these kinds of things, harmful things, is so great? So it's definitely something we have to work on for the balance, but thank you for your, your comment. There's definitely people that, that feel the same way you do. Um, and I'm one of them, so I share your opinion. It's something we need to have control on. Um, all those things, going back to the, 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 the problems with cell phones, um, anxiety, poor school performance, um, social issues, right, friend issues, etc. Every one of those things can be addressed by doing this. Okay. Again, research supports that if you have dinner together as a family, even three or four times a week, that you will have significant decrease in the likelihood of your children facing things like anxiety. They'll do better in school. They've even shown that they'll be uh, more likely to wait before they have sex. They'll be less likely to use drugs. There's all of these benefits that can all be attributed to having dinner together as a family. Somebody asked me at one of my presentations, well, what if we're watching TV while we eat dinner? <laughs> I said, turn the TV off, right? You are still the parent, right? Control this time. It takes 20 minutes, maybe, to have dinner together. But it's that act of being together. And again, notice they don't have cell phones. <laughs> no tablets, no phones. Leave the technology in another room and sit down and actually talk to your kids. If your kids sit there and don't say anything because they're upset about having to have dinner together, make them sit down and have dinner with you. They'll only put up that resistance for a short time and then they'll gradually come out. Okay? And learn the questions to ask. Don't ask what they did in school today. Right? For most kids, that doesn't work. You have to be much more specific in the kinds of questions that you ask, right? And it, the only way you can be specific is by really listening and paying attention when your kids are talking so you know which friend to ask about and what happened that day with that friend. You know specifically what they're working on in their classroom so that you can ask a detailed question about what happened. Because what did you do in school today? The answer is going to be nothing. nothing. Right? So stuff. I can almost guarantee you stuff, right? You're going to get a one word, very short answer that doesn't give you any beneficial information, right? I don't know about you, but I learned a tremendous amount about each of my daughters when I agreed to drive her and her friends' places. They forget you're driving the car after a minute. Right? And all you got to do is listen. Turn the radio down and just listen and act like you're not listening. And you pick up tons of information about what's happening with your kids and with their friends. And then if you're like me, we had a network with their friends' parents. And we were constantly talking with each other and sharing information. Learn this. Heard this. Just FYI. Right? It wasn't a way that we were undermining the trust with our kids. It was a way of parents supporting each other with what was happening. So parents often ask me about friends and controlling friends. You can't do it. Right? You cannot control who your friends, who your, your child chooses as friends. And I hate to tell you, but a lot of it's luck. A lot of it's just who ends up in their classroom, who ends up in that class. But there are certain things that you can do. If your family is a religious family, taking kids to those youth groups uh, is a great way to get a select group of kids that they can become friends with. The Scouts, right, other organizations um, that cater to children are ways that you can kind of encourage certain relationships, but you can't control who your child's going to choose as friend. Just can't be done. And if you try, you get what I call the Romeo and Juliet effect of that forbidden relationship. It just becomes that much more appealing to your child when you tell them you don't want them playing with so-and-so. Right. So, any questions about any of that? Okay, so have dinner with each other. Real quick, look, um, I, I, I just Sorry, throw I this in there. Yeah. I have a question about dinner. Yeah. Uh, so, we do have dinner together every day. Great. I have one daughter, she's 10 years old. Yeah. 
And um, and she eats with her hands, and sweetie, don't eat with your hands, sweetie, with the hands, why again? And then your vegetables, you're not eating your vegetables, and then leave the dog alone. And okay. So it becomes quite stressful to do that. So here's my professional advice. Yeah. Let her eat with her hands. <laughs> So you think it's more important the peaceful yes. Yes. dinner than yes. her learning to Never use her hands. eat with it. She'll change when she needs to change, when it's her desire to change. And believe me, she won't go to school mm -hmm. and middle school and eat with her hands anymore. Okay. Unless it's something that you can appropriately eat with your hands, right? Because that social pressure changes middle school kids really quickly, uh, in most cases. So let it go. But you're the one that has to change how you feel about that. Yeah. Right? She wants to pet the dog while she's eating dinner, let her pet the dog. Right? It's okay. Yeah, she's gonna pick up a few germs. Yeah. We've got study after study that shows us that we overprotected our kids from germs. Mm -hmm. And now their immune systems are not functioning as they should because we've overprotected them. Right? So let her be let her pet the dog at dinner time. Her food falls on the floor. Oh, uh, breathe deep. <laughs> let it all go. Just let it all go and focus on her and try not to even like make a face if she starts eating with her hands again. As much stuff like that that you can let go, let it go. We'll get more into some of this as we get into some of the behaviors. Okay, thank you. So, I, I, again, this is more for me maybe because I'm fascinated by this stuff. Um, but the work of Con Conrad Lorenz. Um, and Ashley Montague, Richard Sorensen, famous, very famous anthropologists, and they've studied other cultures. Um, and I became very interested in this because I was interested in nonviolent cultures, but uh, some of these cultures, you can see the list up here. I was particularly interested in the 4A. Um, in New Guinea, these very isolated tribes. So very, what we might consider primitive by our standards in the way that they live, but they have some things to share with us about parenting. And again, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, kind of like what they do in Britain. Um, they, for example, would expose a child to fire because fire is very important for them for staying warm and for cooking. So they make fires, communal fires. And when they have infants who are able to crawl, so I want you to picture this. So they will not prevent an infant from crawling towards the fire. Make sense? Okay, so here's why. So one, the child's gonna turn away when it becomes uncomfortable, right? Child's not gonna keep crawling into the fire and get burned, okay? It doesn't happen, okay? They might get close enough that it may be, you know, like they get a little like singed hair or whatever. They allow that to happen, right? The second reason is that when the child learns that that fire is hot and dangerous, their anger, if you will, is directed not at the parent, but at the fire, right? If you stop your child, then your child, I'm talking about infants now, your infant is frustrated with you as the parent because you stopped them from something they were interested in exploring, allowed them to go, and they're gonna turn back and be frustrated with that fire so they've learned a very different lesson, haven't they? They've learned a lesson about fire and the heat and danger of fire. They haven't learned an inadvertent lesson that mom or dad or whoever is in this parent role is going to stop me from doing what I want to do. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Is it always possible? No, okay? But it's something I find that parents need to try to do as much as they can. Another example, okay, I go to the beach. We like to do this as a family. When my kids were younger, we went a lot of times to Santa Cruz and went to the beach. And I, we, we go to the beach one day, we sit down, there was nobody there. It was really a beautiful morning. We like to get there early. The first family that came sat fairly close to us. It was a dad with a couple of kids. They put their stuff down. Okay, what do kids do when they first get to the beach? Right, they either dig in the sand or they run to the water. So it was a mellow morning. Their waves were maybe a foot, you know, it wasn't that big. Kids, they drop their stuff and they start sprinting for the water. And the dad screams at them, I told you not to go in the water. Okay. And it's just like, I want to get my, my positive discipline book and walk over and hand it to them. But I know it wouldn't be received in the way that I want it to be. But I see this happen a lot where we set ourselves up with, for failure with our kids by doing these things. 
And if we allow the kids to learn for themselves, you know how cold the water is in Santa Cruz? Okay, most kids will run, and what will they do when their toes hit the water? They'll turn around and run the other way. And then they'll run back again. And they'll go a little further the next time. Just watch a kid. Let them go. Let them learn. And if they get knocked down by a wave, be close enough that you can run out there and grab them if you need to, but let them get knocked down by a wave. There is no greater lesson in the physical power of water than being knocked down by a wave. It's amazing. And that will teach kids to be more careful when they're in the ocean rather than setting up a rule that just ends up being broken anyway. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna push you a little bit, uh, hopefully uh, into a place where you're uncomfortable but still thinking about some of these things. Okay, and so while we're on this topic of going to the beach, yeah. So what if your son um, doesn't want to, like, you know, he's risk averse by nature. Yeah. So what do you do? I mean, how do you, you know, direct him? So, so it's very similar to exposure therapy, and we're going to talk about this in another context later. Um, little bits at a time, right? So you can't push too hard too fast, or it, they'll just go into that fight or flight stage. And so small doses of risk. So, and that depends on the child, very individual, right? So what a child can be exposed to. So, but that, the other thing is for you to model the safety of appropriate risk taking, right? And you can do that in a lot of ways by not only physical things, but also other things, being open to things, right? And so modeling um, very small doses of exposure and then understanding that it's going to take time and that some of it may just be who he is and learning to, to be okay with that, right? So it probably is okay. And if that's where their comfort level is, you're not gonna change that by radical exposure to something different. It has to be very small doses. That all? Okay. So this is all um, around play. So you can imagine, obviously, uh, play is important. So I'm gonna encourage this kind of play. Um, so what do I mean? You're just looking at a pile of dirt. Okay. To me, this is like the child's greatest playground. So the only thing that's missing is water, right? Give a kid a pile of dirt and water, and they can play forever. And the imagination that comes out in that kind of play is absolutely essential to their development. So huge benefits. All kinds of studies have shown that the benefits of play for children are incredibly important. But there's a key. It has to be play where it is not mediated by an adult. This is the hard part for parents. So that's why I'm showing you a pile of dirt, okay? There's no structure to this play. It's not an organized activity. It's not a play date. It's just kids that have come across this pile of dirt. And this can be so valuable, but you have to be prepared, right? Especially if you do introduce water into this because your kids may end up looking like this, right? So, and you have to be okay with this, right? The fact that they're gonna do this, I deal with this at school all the time. So I understand the balance of what you have to weigh out and the decisions you have to make. We have kids that go out after it rains and they wanna play in the mud. Okay? And I am inclined to let them play in the mud. The challenge with that is when they go back to their classrooms, right? So I still want to let them play in the mud. I don't want a classroom that's full of mud. So what do I do? I have a conversation with those kids as much as I can about what they need to do so they understand that if they go back into the classroom, Mr. Francisco is the one that's going to be cleaning it up later. He's our custodian. And that's not fair to him. Kids understand fairness at a very young age, and they understand if they go in and sit down and get mud all over the place, that that's not fair to Mr. Francisco. And so we need to come up with some other ideas about what they can do after this so that it doesn't negatively impact other people. Make sense? But the message that I most want to impart to you is let your kids be kids. Let them play without structured times, activities, 
organizations overseeing them that create a play. And the studies have continued to find that boredom is one of the keys to building creativity. So when your child doesn't know what to do because they don't have that structure and they're bored, consider that a good sign and let them sit in their boredom. It is not your job as a parent to rescue them from being bored. Okay? Okay, I'm going to skip the girl in the next study. And we're going to get to our first behavior scenario. Okay, so I want you to consider this situation. Um, you're taking your kids over to a friend's house to go swimming. Um, whenever you've done this before, or whenever you go to the beach or outside activities, you always put on sunscreen, right? So, but this time, your little son, Johnny, looks at you and screams no with that face, right? What do you do? So I want you just to spend a minute thinking about this. What would your reaction be to your child? And you can put your child's picture in there if you want, if this happens. And if you want to talk about it with people sitting near you, feel free. Yeah, I'll give you a minute to think about it. I think probably the first thing we should do is to ask them why it doesn't really. Probably, I guess the reason was that maybe other kids are uh, laughing at or uh, possible. He might be afraid that other kids might be laughing at him. Okay. Now he is putting some kind of lotion on. The, yeah. For boys. And okay. Some kind of lotion on the face. Okay. So that might be the reason. Yeah, there's all kinds of possibilities, right? I love how you started it. It's your job as a parent to explore this. Okay. Yeah. yeah my son reacted like this uh, sometimes uh, because he doesn't like like the creamy things. The in, feel on his skin. Yeah, he doesn't uh, like the yeah. feel. So I know that I'm aware that he doesn't like it. Yeah. So uh, when he reacted like this, sometimes I don't do do this. Yeah. I respect to him and I don't do. But sometimes I explain to him that sun is can be dangerous uh, to his body. Yeah. Very slowly, you know, if he lets me, you know, just I uh, respect to him that, you know, I just put a little bit yeah. more softly. Yeah. And then sometimes he agrees, sometimes he doesn't yeah. agree. That's it. I mean, yeah. I just don't want to push. Around. Yeah. Because I don't know. It's sometimes it's not worth the battle. Yeah. Right. So that's good. Any other thoughts? I did. Um, I do it before we leave the house, so I say that we won't go <laughs> until they come okay. home. Okay. Uh, yeah, so but sometimes even that doesn't work. So yeah, we've been just yelling at each other basically. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, not a very good situation. But normally saying that we won't go until that normally works. Okay. Of course, you could have a kid be like, I don't want to go. And then, yeah. Okay. So so you, you kind of set up an if then proposition, and those can be really helpful to kids um, as a way of uh, affecting behavior, not controlling behavior, but affecting behavior. So what she did was set up an if then. If you put on the sunscreen, then we'll go. Yeah, and we all okay. do it. So like and, husband, yeah, and, and so those are th those can be helpful. You have to be careful you don't end up punishing yourself sometimes. <laughs> yeah, okay? Yeah, okay. So you may end up missing out on something you really want to do in an effort to hold yeah. yourself accountable to what you said to your child. So it, it becomes a balancing act, right? So thank you for your ideas. The key is that it's never been a problem before, right? And so it's your job as a parent to explore then, like you said, what happened? What's changed now? And the only way to find that out is by asking the child. And here's one of the difficulties, especially depending on the age of the child, is often children will have an emotional reaction to something and will not be able to explain it to themselves let alone you, okay? So the reaction is something that comes from inside of them someplace. It could be based on experience. It could be based on early childhood experience, like infancy, and they don't fully understand it, right? We spend our whole lives trying to figure ourselves out. And as children, they're just in the very beginning stages of this. And sometimes as adults, we want an explanation that they are incapable of providing. So we have to be detectives and look for the clues about what's different. Like your example of the skin sensitivity, we have a lot of kids that are dealing with that. 
you can learn those things, again, by being a little bit of a detective and trying to investigate what's changed. Right? But don't expect all the time that your child, especially when they have this strong of a reaction, is going to be able to explain it. The other thing is don't draw attention to the extremity, is that a word? Extreme uh, volatility, energy behind the reaction. Does that make sense? The drama that they created is something you want to dissipate by ignoring it. And we'll talk more about this later with another scenario. Also, be really careful about the language that you use when you describe behaviors. So language is really important, can make a big difference. If you want, I can send you the slides. Sure, or I can um, just watch it. It's the, also on the YouTube channel. That. Those are my yeah. questions for later. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, I've seen, especially in, for something in the last four or five years in my, um, my work, that there's more and more parents who are using these really adult words, I'll, I'll call them adult words, like violence, harassment, assault, to describe the behavior of young children. And I think we have to be really careful about that, especially when you're talking about your own child. Um, so, you know, saying things like, this is a problem child, or, you know, labeling kids, of course, is something we want to stay away from. Uh, and again, this is another thing that has been studied extensively about how the use of language can really affect how a child ultimately sees themselves and behaves. And so we have to be very careful as parents that we're choosing our words carefully when we talk about kids' behavior. So here's an example. Okay, what's the difference between these two statements? Okay, there's only one word difference. So if you look at it objectively, right, let's see how many words you know versus let's see how many words you know already. The second one, we added one word. Okay, so if you want to look at a negative example of this, when a child says, I don't know how to write, you add the word yet to the end. You don't know how to write yet. And so you're changing the whole paradigm around the thinking by adding one word. So again, the importance of language can be huge, right? And they've done studies that have shown that when we use this type of positive language, we are giving kids what we call agency. So we're building in them the idea that we have the belief that they can change their situation. Make sense? All by adding one little word, okay? Show me how many of these you can read already. That word already is so powerful to kids, okay? So here's all of the things that we get as far as benefits when we change our language just a little bit and are able to tweak it a little bit more positively. We completely change their frame of learning when we add those words to our language. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this part in the interest of time, uh, but this is very similar. Um, a study that was done by Carol Dweck. Anybody read the book, Mindsets? Um, Carol Dweck's a professor here at Stanford. She's a sociology professor, but she's done a lot of studies that have really impacted schools. I believe this book is on your handout. Um, and maybe not, though. I don't know how to put this one on there. Um, but it's a, a very interesting book, uh, again, about the importance of language. And what I find interesting with Dweck's studies is that she put her subjects or kids into groups, not randomly, but by telling some of them, gee, you, you must be really smart. And telling others, it looks like you worked really hard. And by doing that, she can separate and now, she's been doing this for many years, predict exactly how they will perform moving forward based on whether she told them they're really smart or it looks like you worked really hard. And they, she's done study after study after study and they all essentially show the same thing, that you take that group that you showed you're really smart, you told them you're really smart, and they will be less willing to take risks for learning in the future. 
all because of those simple phrases that she uses with them. And you may think this only applies to young children. She's done this with the medical students at Stanford and achieved the same results. Okay? It doesn't matter the age of the child or the person that we're talking about. We can control the frame that they start seeing everything in and their own opinions and views of themselves by the language we use when we talk to people. So again, fascinating the power of this. Um, in our efforts to raise children, we have to be so careful. It's not to scare you about language. You can make a mistake. It's just to get you to start using the language a little differently. Okay, so let's go back to behaviors again. Um, our natural response to what I call big behaviors, those challenging behaviors that we all deal with at times, is often to take power away from children, right? That's probably, I'm guessing, what happened to most of you or all of you when you were a child. In some cases, you were punished, okay? Unfortunately, what kids most need after they have these big behaviors is a sense of autonomy, connection, and competency. It's really hard to recognize that behavior is a way that your child's telling you that they need more power. And you may not want to give them more power, especially if they're using that power to be disrespectful to you, <laughs> right? But that's exactly what you need to try to do. It doesn't mean that you say that the disrespect or whatever the behavior was, was okay. We're not giving them permission to do this again. We're recognizing the intent behind the behavior and addressing the cause rather than the behavior itself. Make sense? Okay. So what do you do if we have behaviors that we're dealing with and we want to be careful about it? One of the first things that I learned as a principal was that when I have a kid come into my office and I'm talking to them about a behavior incident, I never ask them why they did it. I don't ask them why, okay? First of all, I work with elementary children. So kindergarten through fifth grade. Like I said before, many of them can't tell me why, okay? So secondly, why sounds like I've already made up the decision that they're guilty, right? It sounds like an accusation when you say, why did you do that, doesn't it? And it's almost impossible to say it without it sounding like an accusation. So what do you do instead? You ask these curiosity questions. This is right out of positive discipline. Um, and so these are things that you can ask when a child has done something to try to help them explore what happened and what they might be able to do differently next time. Okay, this is on your handout. So those questions are listed there for you. Um, also, again, I'll. I'm happy to share these slides with you if you just shoot me an email. Okay, all behavior is a form of communication. So, yes? Uh, I need to be tempted to try not to yeah. ask my question. Right now, uh, some schools uh, practice like turning cards, like green, yellow, and red. Okay. Uh, like green, is they start with the day green, and yeah. then if two behaviors is not good, then it goes yellow. Are yellow. And if something is really bad, like four warnings, okay. they need to go to office or principal, I don't know. So what do you think about this? I just want to learn your opinion. So, so this is just my opinion, okay? I don't like it, okay? I don't, I don't like the fact that kids can't redeem themselves but end up on this track. You know what I would have done as a kid in that system? I would have gotten to the red every time. As soon as I got the first yellow. As soon as my name was put on the board, I would have been worse, okay? I guarantee you. And I think for some kids, and we're gonna talk about the functions of behavior, for some kids, that's just like, okay, you've already decided that I'm the kid who's gonna talk in class when they shouldn't. So what's, well, I might as well just talk in class whenever I feel awful. So I'm that kid. So that's probably why I don't like that strategy. So I'm, you know, it's my personal bias. But I also feel like we need to be setting things up that first of all are positive. 
So it, I would still have some hesitation based on the work of Dweck and others about even doing it in a positive way, but at least then you're encouraging behaviors rather than just discouraging behaviors. Does that make sense? Yeah. We've done studies and we know that when you, when you say it to a kid, don't run, especially if they're running, all they hear is run. <laughs> That's true, right? We think, I, we've made this really clear, you know, don't run and they're here. There are some kids, it's not all kids, but there are some kids that only hear that. When we frame things in the negative, we sometimes inadvertently encourage that negative behavior. So I would be more inclined to support a positive system. And the PBIS um, is a system that's used here in the Union School District, lots of schools in the county, is designed in that way. So it's similar to what you described, but done positively. Okay? And then and the consequence for not doing those things is you just don't earn the positive reward, but there's no punishment involved like you described. I think teachers are deciding the behavior card because last year, same school, yeah. our teacher was very positive. Yeah. He was in first grade. Yeah. They start the day green and like yeah. uh, blue is better, yeah. purple is very good. Yeah. So they don't go down, like yeah. yellow or red. Yeah. You know what I mean? They just, yeah. they can stay green. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this is done for the whole class? Yeah, whole class. Okay, so, yeah. so do I so go back and tell your teacher yeah. that Mr. Jones said this? But <laughs> So I have a problem with systems that, that are designed to control a group behavior, especially with children. Because, okay, I get the biblical mandate that you're your brother's keeper, but I have a hard time with that. Um, and so I think for children, they need to be able to focus on themselves because it's all they can control. And when you take children and subject them to consequences based on the behavior of those around them, you're setting up a really unfortunate dynamic, in my opinion. So um, I didn't understand. Does that make you sense? You support the second one, or you don't? You, you support I, nothing? I mean, you I would, not agree with any. I would kind. mildly support a positive system. Positive, okay. I still have some reservations about it. Okay. okay? And, I, and we'll talk a little bit about what I would prefer in place of all of those things. Um, but I, I have a real hard time with the negative system, or like I said, having kids suffer consequences because their classmates have been inappropriate. So what, what that does then is just natural, right? If you're that kid who's able to comply and other kids are preventing you from get, earning whatever it is they're trying to earn, then you're gonna be angry towards those kids. That's not what those kids, that's not what those kids need, and it's not what this kid needs. Make sense? Yes, yes. You know, our okay. problem is here. Yeah, so I think it's just thinking about these things rationally, like what, how do kids respond to these things? Is it working, no, right? And, and I'll argue that we can do things to control kids' behavior, but in the long run, it's not going to help that kid become more independent and more mature to take more responsibility for themselves, okay? You can control kids with behavior modification techniques. Those are the same techniques you use to train your dog, okay? We don't want your children to respond to directions just because they're given a direction and a reward or a consequence, right? We want your children to start thinking and using the higher level skills in their brains and that requires a completely different system. I tell parents all the time, you can control your kid's behavior with punishment and rewards, but you're gonna have to increase the punishment and increase the rewards exponentially as they get older for it to continue to work. That's one problem. Second, you're creating a child and then an individual who is focused entirely on extrinsic rewards and consequences. And we know from the research that those people underperform compared to others who are intrinsically motivated. And so, I mean, all kind. And again, these are studies done with adults too. Look at the work of Daniel Pink, for example, who's uh, done an amazing amount of research, has written a number of books about motivation, and he will tell you that when you motivate with extrinsic things, even money, cash rewards, that those people underperform people who are intrinsically motivated if they're trying to solve a complex problem. If you want somebody to do a rote task, like dig a hole, and all they're doing is the same thing, then those extrinsic rewards work really well. There's no thought involved, it's just get it done as fast as you can. 
give them a reward, they'll work harder and faster. Give them an incentive to work faster and get it done sooner, they'll work faster. But we want kids who think, because we don't want to raise kids to be people who dig holes. Nothing against people that dig holes for a living, right? We want our kids to be thoughtful people who can solve complex problems. If that's the case, right, then we don't want to control their behavior with behavior modification techniques. We want to engage their higher level thinking skills in problem solving in order to solve problems and make decisions and make mistakes because they're going to make mistakes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah, yeah. It is difficult also. It is. It's, 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 it's motivation, right? It is. Yeah. This is my challenge, I guess. Yeah, it's, parenting is really, really hard. You wouldn't be here if parenting was easy, right? Yeah. And I, I totally get that. A couple of questions, Ma. Um, so, a similar situation when your um, child's friends are like, you know, being provided all these incentives, like yeah. you know, for scoring well on the test, and your sure. child comes and tells you, yeah. oh, such and such child yeah. got this, yeah. and I'm, I don't know what to tell my child. I'm, yeah, so here's, I, so here's how you respond to that situation. Okay. First of all, you're never going to dispel the resentment that they're not getting whatever the reward is, right? I know kids who get a hundred dollars for things they do at school. Uh, and we can't keep okay. up with what they get. You know? Yeah. So, so consider yourself a loser right away. Okay. <laughs> Just to get over it, you're not going to keep up with some of what other parents can do in the name of rewards. Okay. But here's what you do instead. So you focus on questions about what they did in order to achieve the result that they achieved. Okay, what, so, your child or that? Yes, your child, okay. not the other child. Forget about the other child that got whatever the reward was that your child so envious of, right? You're not going to match that and you don't want to match that, right? Because in the long run, that's going to backfire. Mm -hmm. okay? I almost guarantee you that child is not going to benefit in the long run. So what you want to do is ask questions of them about how they achieved the result that they got. Okay? What did you do? And you can notice specific details about the work if you have it there in front of you. I noticed you added a lot of things here. What gave you the idea to do that? How did you do that? How much effort did you put in this? Right? You want to turn it back on them so that they're acknowledging their own quality of work and starting to take appreciation for, you know, I worked hard. So here's the thing, you want to emphasize without directly saying it, so there is a challenge, right? The thing that your child can control. The one thing that your child can control when it comes to schoolwork, but also a lot of things, is their effort. That's it, right? They can't control how smart they are, although we know now that the brain is like a muscle and they can get smarter, but that's a long, slow process. Right? But they can control their effort. They can't control the quality of instruction that they got. They can't control the quality of materials that they have to work with. Right? There's so many factors that they can't control, but they can always control their effort. And so that's what we want to ultimately come back to emphasizing. You worked really hard on this, right? But you get them to say that. Wow, I really did put some time and effort and energy into this. I feel good about what I did. So, and that means it's from them, right? And it has to be their work. Don't be that parent that does their fourth grade mission, right? So, I mean, we can tell right away when they come to school. We can tell which ones were done by parents and which ones were done by kids. The kid that brings this project that's done by a parent, they have nothing invested in that emotionally. So any of those conversations are lost and then they're more inclined to be resentful when their friend gets whatever reward they get from their parents. Right? So avoid a couple of those pitfalls, focus on the effort, and I think that's the best way to address that. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Mm -hmm. There was another question. Well, yeah. I was going to kind of ask the same thing because it, the kids in the class, the teachers do use a lot of behavior modification. Yeah. Point systems, yeah. Yeah. Um, cards, sticker charts, yeah. know, all the things. And so yeah. I was like, as a parent, what do you do? But you answered. You okay. Answered that question. So that was enough of an answer for you. Yeah, and I, like my teachers know how I feel about this stuff. Um, there are times when short term things like sticker charts can be a benefit for specific kids. Mm -hmm. And then we want to decrease the use of that as soon as we can. 
So we will use them, and it's almost always with kids who are in special education, okay? And they need something, and I'm not saying that a bias, that's just fact. Um, and once they realize they can they can do it because they've worked for the sticker, we pull the stickers back. So it has to be short term. If it's ongoing, long term stuff, you're setting up again all of those unfortunate dynamics. Other questions before I move on? Okay. So behavior is a form of communication. Okay. So it's important to remember that. Okay. Especially when your kids know your buttons. Okay. Your kids get to know you just like you get to know your kids and pretty soon if they don't already know they're going to know what it is that's going to hurt you or make you upset and some of them get really good at playing that button so how do you control that you change your reaction to it right but you have to be aware that it's happening and then you have to again be proactive setting yourself up for being able to do that when it inevitably happens Okay? But kids will communicate to us through behavior because they don't have the sophistication of language to express their ideas. Try to think of it as, you know, this is a message from your child. You're getting a certain behavior, especially behavior that really is difficult for you as a parent. What's the underlying message that your child is trying to communicate with that behavior? Ignore the words that your child is saying or screaming. Right? What's the underlying message? And that can be really hard to get. Okay, I mentioned that there are four functions of behavior. Okay, These are the four, and almost all behavior falls into one of these functions. Okay, The first one, sensory, this is the kid um, who, for whatever reason, gets some kind of pleasure out of the behavior, and there are some kids who are risk takers, and they get an adrenaline rush from this behavior. So I have a few of these right now at Guadalupe who, like, I, they, they are great kids. Love these kids. And they are fun kids, but they will do things, and they are thoughtful about it. They know they shouldn't do it, but they get such a rush from doing certain things that they'll do it even though they know it's something they shouldn't do. Okay? So how we respond to the behavior varies greatly depending on what the function is. And we don't respond to all of these behaviors in the same way. For example, the next one, escape. In my opinion, this is the toughest of the four to help with. Especially, I'm not talking about avoidance. Everybody avoids things that are unpleasant. It's being human. But I'm talking about escape, fight or flight, when for whatever reason a kid is panicked and they just need to escape from something. And that can take a variety of ways that they express that. But responding to that is really challenging because they're in their primitive brains when they get to this escape mode, right? They're thinking using, right, the core brainstem, and it's not something that they're cognitively thinking about. For whatever reason, we've activated that survival mechanism in their brain, and they are fleeing because their survival depends on it. And this is really difficult to address. First of all, when a child or any adult too is in fight or flight stage the brain releases a hormone called cortisol it takes three hours minimum for cortisol to be detoxified if you will by the brain and that cortisol is what gets you that adrenaline so that you can run faster so they're going to go like this they're just going to continue to elevate and they're not going to be able to de-escalate to a place where you can have a conversation about the escape behaviors for several hours. And I know some kids that I work with at school who it takes 24 hours before you can have a conversation that's going to be productive and beneficial. Make sense? That's why I find this one really tough to deal with. Okay, so again, your job as a parent is to be that detective and explore what's happening because your child's not going to be able to tell you if they tell you something, it's just whatever they're coming. They're trying to say something that'll make you happy and make you leave them alone, right? They don't know why they're doing this because if they did, they wouldn't do it. They would solve it in another way. So that one's really tough. Attention, right, is usually one of the easier ones to solve if you can be 
uh, resolve in yourself that you're going to be consistent. So the classic one is you go to the grocery store and your kid wants something off the shelf, right? And you say no. What does your kid do? They ask louder. You say no again. They start screaming, right? And you have three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. This could be common behavior. And here's the challenge. The way to extinguish this behavior is to not respond to the attention. What are they going to do, especially if you've caved before and you've given it to them to get them to stop screaming, what are they going to do when you hold your own and say no and you continue to say no? You've set the boundary, right? They're going to scream even louder because it's not working. So what do you do when it's not working? You ramp it up and you try harder. And you're going to have a full-blown tantrum in the grocery store in public with other people looking at you like you must be some horrible parent or did you just abuse your child, right? They're going to scream and you got to let them scream. So that's why attention can also be challenging, not as difficult as escape, but you have to train yourself, right, to ignore things when that's their function. Tangible access to things uh, is this very similar, right? They want something, they're screaming for it, right? But this can also be, um, they, they want certain freedoms to do certain things, right? It's not just a, an actual physical object. Any question about the functions? All good? Okay. All right, we were gonna watch this video, but we're running out of time and I wanna get to your questions and, and any specific behaviors you have. But this is uh, Stuart Album. If you uh, have a chance to Google this, um, or you can go on YouTube and watch the video. Um, but he is a child psychologist. What was his name? Yes, Album. Um, A L B O M, I believe is how it's spelled. It's a, -B -L a B L O M. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Stuart Album. Um, and in this video. He basically talks about his work with children and behaviors and the bottom line is he says that kids do well if they can and he says that is a radical notion because all of our school systems most of our behavior systems at home etc even in the criminal justice system as we've been in adulthood it's all based around this idea that people and kids do well if they want to and he draws a, a very sharp contrast between that thinking and kids do well if they can. So his point is, if a child, especially if it's a repetitive behavior, but if there's a child exhibiting behaviors, or an adult for that matter, and they are not helpful behaviors, and they're repeating these behaviors, it must be because they lack a skill or skill set it's not because they want to, but our systems of parenting and schooling, etc., are all based around the idea that we need to motivate these kids. Bye, thank you. We need to motivate these kids to want to do better. And he says, that's crazy. But everybody wants to do well. And the research supports him that all kids want to do well um, and are intrinsically motivated to do well, not only academically, but also behaviorally, because they see that by doing well, they will achieve more independence. They get that, but some kids can't do it. So Ablon's idea is that there must be a skill and we need to teach those skills so that kids can be successful, okay? So here's one that he mentions, frustration tolerance. It's very common for kids who have behaviors to struggle with this. It's pretty simple to teach frustration tolerance, but again, it's a long process, right? I talked earlier to Maha about exposure therapy, okay? This is another area where we need to allow our kids to experience frustration. Allow them to go through, don't rescue your kids when they're, when they're frustrated or failing or having a difficult situation. Be there for them don't take over, right? Be the sounding board, be the support, you know, be the loving parent that you are, but don't take over and rescue them. Secondly, teach and play a game. I love the game of chess. I think it's a great game for kids to learn logic and thinking skills. 
It's also a great game to learn frustration tolerance. Okay, shoots and ladders is a good game for younger kids because you're doing really well and all of a sudden you hit one of those long slides and you go all the way back like eight rows. Okay, that's a great game for frustration tolerance. Play these things. And again, don't allow your kids to win. Okay, if they win, great. But don't allow that to happen. Don't give in to them because you want them to experience this frustration. So but they're, they're, yeah, go ahead. About the, uh, my son, for example, doesn't like to play the board games. Okay. Uh, because he doesn't like to rule, he creates uh, his own rule. Yeah, that's common. He, uh, he, he doesn't like to rule, okay, I want to change the yeah. game. And yeah. And he creates his own he's, he, he's, game. Yeah, he's going to manipulate the game so that he wins all the time, right? Yeah. And it's very common for kids to do that. And so, you know, so here's the, what you do as a parent is that, that's not the game of chess. That's not how I would like to play. When you'd like to learn and play the game of chess, let me know. And you get up and you walk away. You don't want to play that game, yeah. right? And neither will his friends. So you're doing him a favor because he's going to have to learn to negotiate with friends. If they, if they always have to do what he wants to do, that's going to set him up for a lot of friends leaving, right? And so as a parent, as hard as it is, you get up and say, I don't want to play this game. Let me know when you're ready to play the game of chess, because it does have established rules, right? So, it's hard. I know. Yeah. But you can do it. I couldn't do it. I know. It's OK. OK, and then, of course, uh, encouraging emotions. Um, and you'd be surprised how often parents will try to dampen emotions. And it happens a lot in public, right? Because it's embarrassing. Your kid's crying or having a fit in public, and you look like that parent that's a bad parent if you're just ignoring it, but you're really not, right? You're encouraging them to express these emotions, and it's okay. We live in a culture that we suppress emotions all the time. It's not healthy, right? It's okay to express these things, especially sadness, right? Especially frustration. It's a, they encourage that to happen. And don't be upset when your child's crying. Crying is a really common emotion, and it's a healthy emotion. It's not something that we should discourage. What do you do if you don't have time? You know, if you're pressured because you have to be somewhere, and suddenly they start yes. crying, and you, you need to go. Yeah. So and, if you and don't have time to let them cry yeah. and feel the emotion, what do you do? To yeah, if you don't have the time, let them continue to cry as you carry them to the car. <laughs> Right? I mean, this is reality that we have deadlines, we have things we have to do. And, you know, as I can't phys physically pick up your kid, but you can, assuming they're a smaller kid. I assume the, the crying is a younger child. When they get older, that's a different kind of thing. Um, but we could talk about that too. Um, but, you know, this is reality. We have to go, we have to go now. But go back and, and be, again, be the detective and dig into that situation a little bit to try to be proactive. Remember, that's our whole talk is being proactive so that next time, because it's going to happen again, right? Next time, perhaps, you can set it up a little differently. So things like advanced warnings work really well for a lot of kids. In two minutes, right, we're going to have to do this, right? And so setting the table a little bit can be helpful. We have a kid right now who we tell him, he doesn't understand time yet, he's a very young child, but when we use the expression, you have five minutes, he'll finish what he's doing in two minutes. So we use that expression all the time, you have five minutes, okay? It sounds a little coercive, but it's really not. It's really setting it up for him so he knows what's coming next. This gets, by the way, especially important with adolescents. Super important. Because they're going to get fixated in certain things, and you need to let them know, hey, we're going to go to dinner, and in five minutes, you need to turn that off so that we can go because we have a reservation, or whatever it is, right? But you're setting it up so that they can be successful. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so I mentioned that there's lots of research that's been done that supports that kids have this intrinsic desire to behave. Um, and most of it comes, or the stuff I really like is Desi and Ryan. Edwards, Desi, and Richard Ryan are uh, researchers at the University of Rochester in New York, and they've been studying child development for over 30 years. Um, 
the, lots and lots of studies, and they all continue to show that kids have this intrinsic motivation, desire to learn self-control, because they see it, again, as the key to becoming independent. Okay. We'll touch on really quickly a couple behaviors that are fairly common. Uh, I mentioned disrespect before. So disrespect, again, is not necessarily what it might appear to be on the surface. Your children love you, right? They do respect you, but they will still act disrespectfully. And most often, not always, most often it's a grab for power on their part. So as they get older, if they're not feeling that they're being given enough independence, again, they're not able to articulate this like I can, right? I've just seen it happen enough to know this is common, right? You need to give them more power. Your inclination is going to be to take power away. But that's the underlying, right, function of the behaviors. They want power. So you need to see that when they're disrespectful. Okay, if you react to every single disrespectful situation, the research has shown that it will just make the kids even more disrespectful. Okay, why? Why would that make them more disrespectful? You're calling them on it. You need to, don't you? Don't you need to point it out that the kid's disrespectful? So why would that backfire? Any ideas? Yeah. Because they have your attention. They have, one, they're getting attention, so the behavior's working, if that's their uh, function, right? Very good point. What else? You already labeled them. Yeah. Yeah. Disrespectful. Yeah, so you put that on and so say, might as again, like I said before, you might as well, you're already that person, right? They're feeling even less powerful. Yeah, yeah, they're feeling less powerful now. So they're inclined to do it more, to try uh, desperately to reach that, uh, that, that, thing that they want, that power, that independence, okay? So you're only going to increase it by doing this, okay? Same kind of thing for a line, okay? Parents often react, teachers, administrators often react very severely to children lying, okay? As a principal, again, when I'm dealing with behaviors and kids lie to me, the kids lie to me all the time. <laughs> kids I have a good relationship that I know well will come in my office and lie to me, okay? I don't get offended by that, okay? First of all, why do kids lie? Almost every case, this is the reason. Anybody know? Okay, kids lie to avoid consequences. They think they're going to get out of trouble if they lie. And they're so afraid of the consequences that they'll tell you a lie. Okay? Most of the time, especially with younger children, it's pretty easy to tell when they're lying. Okay? Don't call them out online. That's my strong advice. Okay, what I do as principal is I move past the lot. I just move forward as if the child had told me the truth. And I'll find out really quickly if in fact they really were telling the truth, which happens in small cases, but I've gotten pretty good at telling, right? Like I said, I've been in education for over 30 years. I've worked with a lot of kids. I can usually tell right away when a kid's lying, but sometimes I'm wrong. And if I move past it, and I just move forward with solving whatever the issue is, and the kid really was telling the truth, they're going to continue to say, but Mr. Jones, it didn't happen. It wasn't like that. But the kid who's lying is going to move right into the problem-solving stage because we've let it go, and now they're past that. And now they see that we're not going to be focusing on the consequences. They may have some down the road, Right? But we're going to focus on solving this problem. We're going to focus on the solution to it. And they're going to help me with the solution, which may include some of what some people traditionally call consequences, like community service is a common one. But I want the kids to help me solve this problem. They take responsibility for solving the situation, not me. Right? The last thing I want to do is suspend a kid from school for behavior. Sometimes I have to, but I try to never do it, right? I want the kid to take ownership for making the situation better. It starts with young children. If they hurt somebody else and that person cries, it's their responsibility to go to the Kleenex box and come back with a Kleenex and help that person dry their tears. So you start at a young age having them take ownership of what they did. It's not based on consequences, okay? And we are out of time. I can't believe it. I, I, so I left a lot out, 
Um, look at the slides uh, if you have a chance. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have individually if you want to stay. Um, thank you very much for coming this morning. Appreciated your involvement, your questions. Super helpful. Can we do one question real quick? Does anybody have one they want to try? We have one that was submitted. Um, do you have one, Maha? I mean, if you can go ahead. I'm going to see, let's see if this one is global. I've been trying my best to use positive discipline, encourage intrinsic motivation at home uh, with my child. At school, though, this teacher uses points to manage behavior and timeouts are given frequently. How do I avoid confusion? Okay, this is a great question. Child is in first grade. Okay, so you have a system that's used at school and you have a system that's used at home. Kids understand that there is a difference between expectations in different contexts. So this is actually an opportunity to teach about the context for behavior, right? Certain behaviors are perfectly fine in one location and in another location, not okay. So a great example is if you're a religious family and you go to some kind of house of worship, there is an expectation for behavior when you go there that's different than what you have at home. What you do inside is different from what you can do outside, right? There's all kinds of contexts, and so you include school and home as examples of two different things. Because you can talk to the teacher about your attitude towards points, etc., but the teacher's not going to change it, especially in November, <laughs> right? And so, and I'm not discouraging you from sharing your opinion with the teacher at some point in a positive, respectful way, of course. I know you would do. Uh, because it's important for teachers to hear that, too. And if they hear that, you know, at home, we're using a system that's based on building the intrinsic motivation of my child. Just FYI. You might want to read the research that's out there. <laughs> right? Because there's tons and tons of research to support systems that build intrinsic motivation. Okay, again, I'm happy to stay and answer any individual questions you might have. Thank you very much for coming. If you could just leave the pins, if you borrowed a pin. The sheets are yours. Um, I'm at Guadalupe as principal. Don't have any cards, but you can find me by going on the website if you want to send me an email. If you want a copy of these slides, I'm happy to send you the slides. Okay, thanks again for coming this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.